In this video, I'm going to discuss the famous Schrodinger's cat thought experiment. And so this thought experiment comes from this paper, which will be linked in the lecture notes, which are linked to in the description down below if you want to look at it for yourself. But it's from the paper, The Present Situation in Quantum Mechanics, which came out in 1935 by Erwin Schrodinger. Uh, so this part here isn't actually getting to the cat thing yet, but this is it's sort of leading up to it. So uh, I'm just going to read the uh, the bolded part here. So so he's talking about a an experiment that looks kind of like this, where we have a particle here, a radioactive particle in the center, and then we have this screen all around that can detect the uh, radiation coming off of that particle. And so the emerging particle, so the particle of radiation is described, if one wants to explain intuitively, as a spherical wave that continuously emanates in all directions, and that impinges continuously on a surrounding luminescent screen over its full expanse. The screen, however, does not show a more or less constant uniform glow, but rather lights up at one instant at one spot, or to honor the truth, it lights up now here, now there, for it is impossible to the experiment with only a single radioactive atom. But this is what he's talking about, where we have this atom in here. And so if we sort of uh, just tr think about it in terms of a single atom, so the wave that comes off of it, or the, the radioac radioactive particle, the particle of radiation that comes off of it, forms a spherical wave and so it would hit this spherical detector at all points but what we actually see is that it hits it at just a single point so it'll just hit it at a single point rather than uh, making sort of a uniform glow over the whole thing uh, and so the detector is in this state phi sub naught here and the particle released is a spherical symmetric superposition that looks like this uh, then the particle detect the particle detector system will be our our spherical wave in the detector wave function here which will just be a superposition of all of them and so the superposition of the detector would make you think that you would see sort of a uniform glow coming off of the whole thing since the whole thing is in a superposition uh, sort of similar to what we were talking about in the previous video with our sort of generic measurement system that that pointer would be pointing in sort of all of the directions at the same time. And so in other words, no one particular direction is picked out for the particle or the flash, yet we do not see a uniform surface glow, but instead it's detected only at one spot. So this brought Schrodinger to his famous cat thought experiment. And so the setup for it is this. So we have a radioactive uh, a radioactive atom in here and so if it decays it lets off a particle of radiation that will then uh, touch on this right here that will cause this hammer to drop releasing this poison and killing the cat here and so this is where he says the uh, the sort of famous cat thought experiment I'll read this one in full just because it's sort of the most famous one. So one can even set up quite ridiculous cases. A cat is penned up in a steel chamber along with the following device, which must be secured against direct interference by the cat. In a Geiger counter, there is a tiny bit of radioactive substance. So that's what we have right here. So small that perhaps in the course of one hour, one of the atoms decays, but also with equal probability, perhaps none. If it happens, the counter tube discharges and through a delayed release, a hammer which shatters a small flask of hydrocyanic acid. If one has left this entire system to itself for an hour, one would say that the cat still lives if meanwhile no atom has decayed. The psi function of the entire system would express this by having it by having in it the living and dead cat, pardon the expression, mixed or smeared out in equal parts. So the cat being sort of simultaneously dead and alive. 
And so more formally, uh, after some time, the wave function will evolve according to the Schrodinger equation into a superposition of decayed and not decayed. Or if we want to look at the full apparatus, we have decayed, uh, shattered, and dead, plus not decayed, not shattered, and alive here. And so when Schrodinger was trying to do these thought experiments, or what Schrodinger was trying to do with these thought experiments was show that the wave function or product of wave functions was incomplete. Uh, in other words, that it was not a full description of quantum of the quantum system. So the thought experiments were a reductio ad absurdum, which is an argument that essentially is supposed to show that you, uh, if if this thing is true that you're accepting, then you have to also accept some absurd or contradictory, uh, some contradictory state of affairs, and so therefore the thing itself cannot be true. Uh, and so it's a reductio ad absurdum, since it is the case that we do measure particles in only one spot, and it is the case that cats really are dead or alive, not smeared out between the two states. And so this suggests that there must be hidden variables. Uh, so our, our wave function is incomplete, and so there must be some other hidden thing in the wave function to complete it. Those are called hidden variables. So things about the state of the system not captured in the Schrodinger equation. So we can think about this in a syllogism known as a modus tollens, which has the this sort of form. So we have this conditional, if P, then Q, uh, we deny the consequent, and therefore the antecedent cannot be true. And so it, it would be this way. So if quantum mechanics gives a complete description of the system, so the particle plus probe plus pointer and everything in between, then the measuring apparatus, the pointer, will be in an ambiguous superposed state. So whether that's our spherical screen being in a uniform glow or our cat being both dead and alive at the same time. Uh, so the measuring apparatus, the pointer, so the cat or the spherical screen is not in an ambiguous superposed state. So we're denying this, this uh, consequent right here. So therefore, the antecedent, uh, which was that quantum mechanics gives a complete description, is not true. So therefore, quantum mechanics does not give a complete description of the system. Uh, so the particle, pointer, probe, and everything in between. So in the paper, uh, Schrodinger says this, uh, and I'm just going to read the bolded part here. So he says, there is a difference between a shaky or out of focus photograph and a snapshot of clouds and fog banks. And so essentially, quantum mechanics is not a picture of a particle cloud, but a cloudy picture of something definite and classical. So the particle he's saying itself must be definite and classical, but it's just our picture of it is what is uh, is what is cloudy and therefore uh, giving the sort of probabilistic uh, and superposed kind of uh, picture that we are seeing. And so this is because there cannot be a fundamental distinction between the classical and quantum realms. So at which point can we say that, you know, right here is where things stop being quantum and start being classical. So if quantum mechanics does not accurately describe classical observations, so things like detectors lighting at specific places, cats being differently alive or dead, then quantum mechanics must be incomplete. Uh, so, in other words, the particle in a superposition of three states like this, it must be that the particle definitely is in just one of those states. It's simply that we are ignorant of which one it is. And so I sort of uh, put the, the same image I had above of that, of that circular detector up here where I show the wave kind of going out in all directions, but uh, it's uh, only going out in a single direction, but it just looks blurry and cloudy to us. And so this could be called the ignorance interpretation of quantum mechanics, uh, that the particle is in a definite state, but we just don't know what that state is until we measure it. Uh, but this view has a difficult time explaining the 
double slit experiment where a single particle can interact with itself to cause an interference pattern. And so we have a superposition that looks like this. Uh, if this is just a description of our ignorance and the particle definitely goes through either slit one or slit two, then there's no accounting for the interference pattern. So this is a double slit pattern here where we see this interference going on uh, compared to the single slit, which is a little more smooth. So there, I mean, there are interactions with the sides of the slit. So you do get a little bit of uh, some interference going on, but it's nothing like with the double slit experiment where the sort of, uh, you know, wave function being actually true of the particle does explain the double slit experiment because a single particle going through interferes with itself because it, it is in fact smeared out and therefore going through both slits at the same time. And so that would account for the, uh, for the interference pattern that we see. And so this sort of ignorance interpretation, uh, which seems like it, it has to be the case because, you know, our cats are either definitely dead or definitely alive. And we do definitely see just lighting up on one point on our detector rather than, you know, a bunch of points at the same time. And so there is this sort of discrepancy here between what we see in our measurements and uh, what the wave function is telling us must be true here. And so in conclusion for sort of the last this video and the video before it, we can think of the measurement problem in four following ways. So what do we even mean by measurement? And so this is, goes to that John Stuart Bell quote from the last video. So how do we distinguish measurements from non-measurements? But Assuming we can make such a distinction, why does there appear to be a split between the quantum and classical realm? So why can these particles be quantum mechanical in nature, but then, uh, you know, when it interacts with our measuring device, uh, our measurement gives a very classical outread for it. You know, at what point does it, between the particle being measured and the readout, at what point does it go from being quantum to classical? At what point do we sort of go from the quantum realm to the classical realm? Uh, then if we dispose of this realm's view, how come we do not see quantum effects in our measurement apparatuses when measuring quantum systems? So if we say that there is no two realms, that it's all quantum, you know, because everything is made up of quantum systems, and so we would therefore have to say that the classical realm just is the quantum realm, then how come we don't see quantum effects in the quote unquote classical realm? How come our measuring device doesn't show superpositions of states? How come we can't see uh, cats that are both alive and dead at the same time? Uh, and then four is just what the hell is a collapse of the wave function anyway. So the collapse of the wave function is a postulate of quantum mechanics, which means that there's nothing in quantum mechanics that says that, that, you know, that this collapse idea just sort of falls out of. It doesn't come from the Schrodinger equation. Uh, it's just sort of postulated that, well, when we do a measurement, if, if we, assume we can even define what that is, the wave function just collapses. And so that's why, that's what, that's why we see, uh, you know, classical things in our quantum systems. That's why our measurements are classical, even though the system is quantum. And so it's, it's a bit ad hoc. It's just sort of, uh, it's just sort of added on to the, uh, the theory, you know, everything just sort of evolves according to the Schrodinger equation. But then when we measure it, there's this quote unquote, collapse and then we get a measurement that is you know that is very classical that has a definite sort of value and so those are the issues of what is called the measurement problem in quantum mechanics and there really isn't a good uh you know way of sort of uh rectifying this situation people have tried in the past to come up with with ways of sort of uh, rectifying this 
measurement problem, but there still really isn't to this date a good way of of sort of uh, fixing this problem, of sort of coming up with a solution to this problem. And so it's still kind of an open question. Uh, but anyway, I don't want to ramble too long. I hope you found this video interesting, and I will see you in the next one.